Hello everyone and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today as we are going to be talking about how to share your content and what are your options with iSpring. My name is Paulina, I am a community manager and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And I want to remind all of you who have just joined us for this webinar that this is our ninth lesson out of the 10 session uh, webinar series on how to create great e-learning content from A to Z. And I'm super excited for all of you guys who have been with us from the very first webinar. And I'm very excited for you who have just joined us. And I hope that you will like this session. So uh, let me please introduce our speaker. We have today with us Michael Shiashi. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Hi, Paulina. I'm doing great. Thanks. Michael is a technologist at Alternative Media, and he will be more than happy to um, cover this topic for you guys. And he has been covering, he has been the leader for all the webinar series, and we greatly appreciate it. So thanks, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and I also have a very exciting news for you guys. You can win the online consultation with Michael. You can either get a 30 minute, 45 or 60 minute of it by simply doing a very easy task. What do you need to do? You just need to share what you've learned at this webinar series after the series ends, and then post your comments under the main blog post, which I have shared in the chat section. And after that, just simply get all your relatives, friends, family, coworkers, peers, maybe total strangers to vote for your comment. And after um, a week at our next webinar, which is going to be held on November 1st, we are going to see the top three comments and this will be our top three winners. So we will announce our winners at the beginning of this webinar. Okay, so moving on, let me please also introduce our technical support engineer. Uh, his name is Alex Dim, and he will be taking care of any support questions or iSpring related questions that appear during um, the webinar or Q&A session. So um, yeah, Alex is here, by the way. Come here, say hi. Hello. <laughs> He will be joining us just in a moment. And um, I just also wanted to let you know that, yes, we're going to have a Q&A session at the very end of the webinar. So don't forget to submit your questions, comments, or concerns in the question box. And you may find it on the right side of your GoToWebinar panel. OK, so I think at this point we are ready to begin. I hope that I didn't forget anything. So let me please grant the presenter rights to Michael. Fantastic. All right. Clicking the buttons and making it happen. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, verify, Polina, you can see it? Yes, I sure can. Fantastic. Well, welcome, everyone, and, and thank you to Polina and Alex and everyone at iSpring for doing this really exciting webinar series. So how to create, uh, create great learning content from A to Z. Uh, so I appreciate it. We're at number nine, as Polina mentioned, of 10. So next week will be our final wrap up where we showcase. But today we're going to talk about uh, sharing content and the options available to it. Uh, so as Polina mentioned, thank everyone that has attended thus far. And thanks for attending today. Uh, the obligatory background information on me, I, my name is Michael Shiashi. I'm uh, with uh, Alternative Media, uh, and uh, you can find us on the web, of course, uh, at alternativemedia.com, alter-native-media.com. Um, I have been in uh, e-learning and IT for 20 years or so, starting out in the uh, academic community, uh, working now for several corporate entities and government uh, contracts. So I have a bachelor's in film, a bachelor in native studies, a master's of fine art and 3D modeling for games and simulation. So as we continue on, you'll, you'll hear me talk a lot about innovation and, and uh, engagement. And so, of course, that's been my focus for a number of years. So as Polina mentioned, the, the webinars go through where I present some information, but my style is laid back and, and casual. Please use the chat window, use the question areas. Uh, ask a question specifically to me or the iSpring technology. Uh, if you want to tweet, you can tweet at mass underscore edev or iSpring Pro. Make sure that you're actively participant in our conversation uh, as we have a lot of information. So, and, and feel free to chat with each other about various uh, solutions you found or such. So 
let's take a quick look back at what we've done thus far in the webinar. Um, this is last week's webinar, so we talked about accessibility, uh, what the standards are, Section 508's update to WCAG 2.0 AA. I included a, a blog post to kind of understanding the differences and the update of it. Uh, how to achieve accessibility inside PowerPoint itself. Uh, Microsoft provides a lot of good information about how to ensure the PowerPoint itself uh, is accessible uh, using things like alt text for images and making sure that uh, there's color contrast for text, making sure that your fonts are large, uh, and of course dealing with videos and, and captions and subtitles. There are other tools I covered. I also included a blog post last week to show you uh, some uh, ways and some tools that are available out there. We dove a little deep and talked about making sure that the text uh, is accessible, making sure the color contrast ratio uh, is conformant to the WCAG 2.0 AA standard. There's more information on the link uh, that we provided last week on how to do that, uh, as well as using the little wizard in order to make sure the color contrast. Uh, and then we took a look at some ways to make sure that the captions for videos uh, were accessible uh, and ways that you can add them into the PowerPoint pipeline and iSpring production and development pipeline. So we covered quite a bit, including uh, some considerations for mobile, making sure that your image file size was um, compact and making sure links and buttons were actually clickable or pressable uh, on uh, mobile devices and, and things to consider about videos to make sure that they you've tested them on each device because not all um, videos autoplay or play automatically. So let's take a wide 50,000 foot view of what we've done. So we're in week nine, as you can see. We have covered quite a bit all the way from pre-production and pre-development, uh, how the pipeline will develop, um, making sure we understand our role and the SMEs roles and our stakeholders. We've looked at ways to uh, create and author our own content and narration scripts, as well as what's going on on screen. Uh, we looked at ways not only to uh, edit and record audio, but later on, we also took, to, took a look at uh, making sure that our as assessments and quizzes were engaging and enhanced. Uh, we made sure that we had interactive and engaging content. Uh, we looked at best possible practices for user experience and user interface. Uh, last week, as I mentioned, we looked at ways to polish up what you've done thus far. Today, we're going to put all that together and look at ways to publish and share your content out. Uh, and then, of course, next week we'll do sort of a wrap up uh, and a culmination of some best in show. So today, uh, just a quick overview, we're going to take a look at uh, publishing and it's going to be just an overview of, of publishing with iSpring, the different ways you can do it, publishing the web to an LMS, to the cloud, to iSpring's cloud and to the Learn LMS system. So we'll also take a moment and remember, don't you don't have to save your questions to the end. You can uh, submit them at any time, but we'll have a QA session towards the end. Uh, so feel free to jump in on that. So jumping right in. So what we've done is, is taken a look at what we'll do and how to publish uh, iSpring content to e-learning. So we'll, uh, before we do any publishing as always and as any time, uh, make sure that you not only have rechecked and double-checked everything you've done, uh, made sure that you've retested it in various devices to see how it looks and feels. Um, look to make sure that you have added alt text and other considerations for accessibility, and, and more importantly, done this yet again. So as, remember, we continue to talk about our pipeline or our development process, you need to allow time in the publishing process for this additional testing previous to and after. So uh, a consideration to, to do before publishing. So uh, going into this, there's just the publishing tab. So let me go into, I have a ready um, PowerPoint here. It's the Space Shuttle Program uh, lesson course that you can download from iSpring. Uh, and I have pulled it up here. And so we can go into the publish settings, clicking here on publish in the iSpring tab. And in just a moment, the publish window will come up. I have another PowerPoint open, so that's probably taking some time. So you have various different configurations. You can see you can publish for web to CD, to the cloud, to um, iSpring's LMS, to Learn, to LMS, just a regular LMS if you have your own or use another or to video. So uh, we'll go through each of these, but I just wanted to show you where to uh, get to the publish settings. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's various different ones to go through. So it's taking just a moment to get back over to my slide deck. So hold on. Am 
my bad. I must have hit publish. So here we go. Going back to the slide deck. So uh, let's take a look at some options when we look at the published settings. So uh, publishing for web. Once you get into that tab, you'll you'll notice um, various things. Uh, so right off the bat, there's an area to include the title for your published web. Uh, there are uh, the different player settings, and remember we went over those in a couple of different lessons and webinars this week about what the different presentation modes were and how they affect the user experience and user interface. Uh, and we went a little bit over that. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go back into the slide deck and show you that area. Um, again, I would suggest that you test that uh, and make sure it works for your area. So let's go into the publish. And again, it may take just a second. Uh, and then we will go into the various players. Uh, we can pick from the one of the a couple of presets, but we can also go in and customize each of these uh, a little further uh, in making sure that the colors and the text labels such as uh, next or previous uh, match what we need for our learners and for our content. Uh, we can adjust the layout, including information on the top bar, sidebar. So this is a lot of information to go through, but again, uh, we, we did a high level in previous weeks, uh, but I wanted you to know where it was. Uh, going back to the slides, uh, there's also the output. And again, uh, there are several outputs. You'll notice mine every time I show is, is set to the mobile HTML5, um, uh, not into the flash. And that's a personal reason. Obviously, many of you know that uh, for our modern browsers, Flash is a little bit not only outdated, but antiquated and, and um, recommended not to use anymore. Uh, so I would suggest doing that. So let's take a look at some of the individual tabs in the web settings and the web uh, publishing. So the playback and navigation uh, is an important one. I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, there are various options that are preset. Uh, you can also save your own preset. Um, and, and uh, you can have it change, um, start the presentation automatically. Uh, you can have it uh, go prompt to restart, uh, and that would be saving your place, like would you like to leave a start where you leave off, uh, and then navigation type, making sure that you understand how your learner should be navigating through, uh, whether it's slide by slide. And let me back up and go uh, back to our uh, space shuttle slide. So one thing I wanted to mention is as you're preparing for publishing, make sure that you have gone in, again, this goes back to before you begin, make sure you go into the presentation explorer and make sure that all the branching or any navigation is set up as you want. Uh, again, that would be a final uh, sort of pre-flight check uh, before you publish. So this, this is the tab that you would see some of those options, uh, especially down below in section three I've listed here where we make sure that we enable gestures like pinch and zoom uh, and making sure that we allow those things for mobiles. So uh, let's take a look at the optimi optimiz optimization tab. So this is where we would optimize our content. Remember, uh, in a previous webinar, I mentioned this area is where you would reduce file size if need be. Uh, remember, some LMSs have a limit. So if you have a lot of media, a lot of information, um, just for an example, I think, say, like an open source LMS like Moodle takes, um, I think it's a 100 megabyte limit of a content package. So in this area, in the compression is where you would set some of that information, especially if you needed to find that balance uh, between your content uh, and file size. And so uh, as I've listed here, one way to do that is, is really just sort of publish it out and check by default. Uh, you see that it compresses a little bit for images, making sure that uh, it reduces the file size a little bit while maintaining the quality. Uh, you can adjust this as needed, but uh, for the most part, I would say leave as is, uh, and unless you have already addressed that. Um, again, that's something that needs to be tested as you publish. So let's take a look at the Web Publishing Advanced tab. Uh, and again, as we go through these tabs, we're starting to get into a lot of really good information. So uh, in the first section I've outlined here is where you would set the file dimension of what you want to be shown on screen. Um, I would recommend a four by three ratio. And again, you can figure out the ratio, the, and that's in the size. Uh, that's my recommendation for tablet. However, if you've previewed in tablet already, you know that it looks pretty good. Um, but I, that's just a recommendation of my own. So uh, enable video narration. Uh, make sure that uh, there's a narration file for each slide uh, if needed, and that helps with the accessibility. And also make sure that the audio and font is checked. Now these are, as you can see, have already been checked for me. In most cases, they will be. However, I wanted you to see if you needed to make any changes where these would be located. And again, this is in the web publish area. 
Uh, and then finally, the protect. So many of you may not use this normally, but let's say you had some information and content that you've created that needs a watermark um, or a sample only or for testing purposes. Um, here's where you can add a password if need be. You protect the entire content of this particular one with a password. Um, you can also have time restrictions if it's a time material that's only good to a certain date. Um, or if you have a little bit more configuration you need to do about making sure that it's played uh, inside your intranet, and, and that would be in the domain restriction area uh, or other sites. So there's a lot of um, things here in the protect tab that you would uh, choose and, and adjust. Um, you may not normally do these, but again, if your content or if your specific environment requires it, this is where you would do it. All right, so that's the published setting. So let's break for a moment and, and do poll question number one, Polina, and I'll go ahead and read it while you do it. Just so, one second. <laughs> no problem. I kind of sprang that on you, so no problem. So while she's uh, setting everything up there and pushing all the buttons and levers and such, looks like the poll's open. Thank you, Polina. Uh, so before today and before we mentioned it, were you aware of all the different settings, specifically the compression and advanced published setting. So those are the tabs I mentioned. Those are the compression uh, and advanced tabs. Uh, were you aware of those before today? Yeah, and it looks like um, almost everyone has voted. And the most popular answer is yes, sort of. Right, and that's that's very cool. So thank you. Let's go ahead and close that. So not surprising that Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to share really quickly. Mm -hmm. I And so that's good. So uh, it, it looks like most of us had an idea of some of those. So hopefully today you've got a little bit, um, you know, deeper dive into that. And so I uh, wanted to make sure that we shared that with everyone as well. So. All right. So let's take a look at the published LMS setting. So um, this is where we would jump a few tabs down. Let's go back to our publish settings in our Space Shuttle slides. We'll go to the Publish button inside iSpring. Uh, we'll take a quick look here, and this would be uh, in the LMS setting here. Uh, and that we started here at the web, and we're using the left uh, navigation control at the bottom uh, to choose LMS. So let's take a look at some of the tabs available with that. Uh, so inside the general tab, you'll notice that it's very similar to what we did for publishing the web. There's a place to put the name of the course or the content. Uh, there's a place to, to choose where to publish it out. You would choose it, you know, uh, either uh, somewhere you could know where that's at. Uh, again, I have chosen not Flash. I've chosen HTML5. Some of you may need to choose uh, Shockwave for whatever reason, uh, but normally I would suggest not. Uh, and then the... Um, there's an area to choose whether or not to allow iSpring Play. So if you hover over that uh, I icon, uh, it tells you what it is, and it's allowing the mobile users to have a, a player uh, that doesn't uh, need an internet connection in order to go. So that's something you can test as well if your learners um, need that. And then, of course, zip output. And that would be important uh, here in a moment when we talk about the SCORM package or AICC package for the LMS to actually use it. Um, and that information is in the learning course tab of the LMS. Uh, and so notice that you can specify the type. Now, when we specify the type, there are several to pull down from, including SCORM 1.2, 2004, AICC, uh, XAPI, and CMI5. So this is where you would specify how the content package is put together so that it communicates with whatever LMS you have. So you, this, behind this, once you choose the type, you would also put in the title, uh, the description, any keywords that needed to be added uh, that the LMS would require. So, and then the three, uh, the section three of the progress and completion is where you would say uh, how to report, complete and complete. Uh, and you can customize some of that, but normally you would leave it as is, and which is dependent on the type. Uh, and those of you that know the difference between SCORM 1.2 and 2004 uh, understand what I mean by the difference between complete and complete pass-fail. So uh, those are the two major tab sections on the LMS. I wanted us to be alerted to that, uh, as also as the different types of SCORM configuration. So another quick poll question. Um, Polina, let's go ahead and put this up. And again, this is just sort of testing your knowledge and generating some discussion. Uh, so do, do, do you know 
what your LMS communication requires? Do you know what communication or API standard uh, that your LMS that you use for your content, if you use one, requires? Uh, SCORM uh, versions 1.2 or 2004, AICC, Blackboard, CMI, or XAPI. So let's see what we've got in the polls here. Whoa, so far 76% is uh, the first answer, SCORM 1.2, SCORM 2004. Very cool. So, and that's not surprising. So, um, it is interesting, and so we can go ahead and close that uh, here in a moment. From what I see, it's very interesting that we have a few uh, individuals that actually use X XAPI. Um, so, that's very cool and very interesting. And so, um, we have a couple of others about the same amount using AICC and Blackboard. So, that, that makes sense. But um, feel free to share any additional information about that particular poll question. I, I wanted to cover that and, and kind of get, and it's interesting to see that there are some active users of XAPI, so good on you. Um, and, and most of you know the TinCan or XAPI, Experience API, is the uh, sort of newer standard to communicate uh, user experience uh, in an action verb sort of way. So uh, go ahead. I just wanted to, to ask a quick question. Uh, from Kristin, is there a good reason now to use Shockwave at all and not HTML5 given the move to HTML5? So is there a reason to use it at all? Yeah. Um, okay, so there might be, um, and I can't answer that, but but let's say your particular, let's say you use things on the on an on a intranet, on a closed business system, so you might be required or there might be a, a policy suggestion that, you, that makes you use Shockwave. Um, I will just speak from my own opinion here. I would say no, but there may be some reason I don't know about that's specific to your your case or your your content. Um, for the most part, I would suggest using HTML5 um, from now on. Now, again, that's just me, um, but that's what I would suggest. So, but I appreciate that question. So, yeah, and Tony says yes. My PowerPoint slides are full of Flash modules. That's a good point. So if you do have, uh, and, and, and so if you have built-in flash modules or built-in Shockwave, it does make more sense, as again, there's always an outlier, right? But it does make more sense to publish to both Shockwave and HTML5. So I have it tested, but, but maybe um, the good people at iSpring have an um, understanding of how, if at all, uh, some of those Shockwave modules come out if it's a HTML5 only. Uh, and then, then again, testing would need to be done if, even if it happens. So, Thank you very much. So we'll take a quick look at publishing to iSpring Cloud. Uh, so you see here I have a, a quick little series of images. So uh, let me go into that area and show you where that's at in the publish settings. So here in our Space Shuttle slides, we go to publish. Um, we have already covered the web and the LMS section, and this would be the iSpring Cloud section. Um, and so, let me get out of that. And so, in this area, it's it's something I wanted to point out. Uh, for those that haven't tried it, I suggest trying it. it it's great. Um, go to this area and follow the on-screen uh, areas. So, you'll notice it's set up in the different tabs, very similar to what you have. You may need to set up a, an account for the iSpring Cloud if needed, but basically you would use this area like you would use other, uh, say, Dropbox or other uh, file sharing um, cloud-based solutions. So um, a lot of the settings will be the same. Um, you need to set up you know, where you want it to uh, save in the repository in the cloud, uh, and then basically you can publish and upload things to cloud. Let me uh, pull up my... Um, my version of the cloud, so you kind of see the interface. So, uh, and you'll notice that a lot of the information I have shared here is from our webinar series. Um, but basically, it's an area I can upload to from inside PowerPoint and, and share the content. Uh, and I won't. This is not all about iSpring Cloud, so I won't go into a lot of it. But you can notice there are sharing settings where you can share by a public link, by email. You can embed it on another web page. You can set uh, whether you don't want uh, someone to download the entire thing or sharing is off. So there's a lot of different ways to share um, content once it's been uploaded to cloud. But it can all be done inside the, the publish area here uh, in iSpring Cloud. And I did want us to uh, see that. So um, quick poll question. I think this is the last one for those that are tired of clicking in. So let's <laughs> go ahead and open this one up, Paulina. So did you know that uh, iSpring allows 
the creation of those shareable links and content protection inside iSpring Cloud. Were you aware of it before today? Okay, it looks like um, almost everyone has taken the vote. And let me please close this poll question and share the results with you. Very cool. It sounds like um, some knew about it, but most did not. And so um, I'm glad we could cover that topic and, and share everyone. So in the same vein, um, you can uh, publish the iSpring Learn LMS. And so that may be new to you as well. Uh, notice that it looks very similar to the other ones. Let's go back to our publish area, and I'll show you where it's at. Here's the tab for it. Uh, here's a, a small uh, vignette that kind of shows you what's going on, uh, talking about tracking learner's progress and all the good stuff that goes along with it, um, learning on the go offline, and then starting now. So this is where you would set up the account and such. Um, and also within that same area, uh, this is where you would set the course options like we talked about earlier. This would be similar to the LMS settings that we went through. Uh, about different things that are needed. But this is the area that you could do it in one stop and upload it to the LMS, connecting to the iSpring or Learn LMS. Uh, and it's very similar, as I mentioned, um, to the iSpring Cloud, meaning that it's the one-stop shop of publishing it from inside the content you just created. So I wanted to alert us to all that. Uh, I'm not going to ask if you're aware of it, just like I did from the other one, but I did want to show it to you. Uh, so these are a lot of high-level informations that we provided today. So we talked to look, we took a look at how to publish for web, uh, how to look at uh, publishing just for a standard LMS, depending on which type. Uh, I kind of gave you a query of what type of communication you had, and we had uh, good information on that. We talked about publishing to cloud, and, and just now we took a very brief look at the Learn LMS. Now these don't, any of these don't get down into the particulars of account or your own LMS and what type that is, whether it's Saba or, or Moodle or what are the other LMSs there. Uh, that could be a whole webinar series in itself. But today we just wanted to show you, now that you've gotten to the idea, now that you've created this really beautiful content and put the polish on it, here is the one-stop area to publish out to the various aspects. So what I'd like us to do now, if possible, let's, let's start with questions. Let's dive in deep and talk about particulars uh, and let's see what we have going on. Okay, wonderful. So let me begin with the first question. Just a second. So it's from Christine. My understanding was that Blackboard used SCORM 1.2 in 2004. What is the Black Blackboard 9.x option for, or how is it different? I have not used Blackboard in a number of years. So last time I did, you're correct, I used the SCORM, um, the communication. Um, so, Alex, is there any information from your side on that? I, I don't know that. I, I would double check if you do use if you use Blackboard, what it suggests at that point. Again, it's been a, a couple of years since I've been inside of it. The only suggest that I can give you is that uh, when you publish to Blackboard, it, uh, your course will become more compatible with this system, with this particular LMS system. However, you can always publish to SCORM and then move your presentation to Blackboard. Okay, good, thank you. And so with that, I would also, as, as he mentioned, is testing. So if, if let's say that you, you, know, you didn't use the Blackboard version um, package that you just did SCORM, whichever version, then upload it and make sure, as he mentioned, that you know, everything is you know, communicating well, everything's firing off well, uh, and there's no way to do that without publishing and testing. So. Thank you very much for that additional information. All right, and moving on to the next question from Michelle. In two sentences, what is the difference between SCORM 1.2 and 2004 functionally? In two sentences, okay. Um, <laughs> in two sentences, um, and I'm, I'm just giving a brief overview, is, is the pass fail. And so there's a lot of different ways on the reporting side, a lot of the nuanced stuff I won't get into, but uh, and, and feel free to jump in, everyone, please, and help out here. Um, it, it, it's just the communication of a complete, incomplete, or pass-fail. So one, I think, on the older one was pass-fail. It suggests um, 
you know, that, that there is in the communication that there's maybe been a testing or something. Uh, in the other configuration, I think on the version 2004, it's simply the learner do whatever you want to call complete, whatever that is, be it, um, you know, a number of slides out of so many or whatever it is uh, that they say the close button or whatever it is that you want to make sure that they've gone through whatever you required uh, as the content developer or designer. Um, so that's my take on it. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, guys, please share if you have something to share. Okay, and the next question is for Alex from Michelle. When uploading your zip file to the LMS, do you unzip extract the folder for it to function? Or That's the point of Squarm, and you need to publish to zip package, and then move this solid zip package to your LMS system, and LMS system will unzip it on it end, uh, and move it to your structure, to your courses, and this way you will see what's in this zip package. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is from Amanda. What does it mean to publish on the web? What would the common avenues be? And this, I guess, Michael can take care of. Sure, I'll do my best. So um, the, generally speaking, and, and help me um, make sure I understood the question. So uh, going in and publishing via web, uh, and, and so wanting to know what would be the general pipeline or avenue was the part of the question? Yes. OK. So in this case, um, there's a couple of things I can consider uh, as far as why you would publish to the web. Uh, one, that you are not making this content sit on an LMS, or two, um, and in which is still part of one, uh, that it may need to sit on a particular website, or on your personal website, or on a company website, or even an intranet, as I continue to talk about. Uh, in this way, or even something that uh, needed to be part of a public-facing whatever it is, say a survey quiz, or uh, a testing quiz, or something you, you wanted to have a FAQ on your public website. In this way, this would be one way to use the web function. Um, in, in many cases, I've used it to uh, showcase and demonstrate for a public-facing non-LMS configuration what can be done with uh, iSpring and, and how to push it further in, in using those interactions that we talked about, I think, in week three or four, which are you know the FAQ, the timeline, uh, the interactive book, that sort of thing. So these are, these are ways that you would put it out on an actual web server or inside a local uh, testing environment or inside your local intranet. So. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of questions are just coming in. <laughs> okay, Good. so uh, the next one, what's the difference between publishing as a CD versus a video? Question from Kathy. Okay, well, so we'll take, since I have this open, so the difference being that uh, as it publishes out, and, and so Alex, I may uh, get, I may, I may ask for a little bit of help on this one. So, um, I don't want to, I didn't want to cover these necessarily because these are specialized in my experience. So uh, I would more often publish for web or learning LMS or iSpring Cloud. Uh, but as you go through these, uh, you get to choose the video profile. And these save as, um, are these MP4s when these get done? Yes, that's correct. Right. The output file will be in MP4. So in which case, there would probably be no um, uh, so triggers that are activated, or if they were, they're automatically activated, but it would save the any animations or transitions or timings from the content you've created in PowerPoint into a, a self-contained video, as I understand it. Is that correct, Alex? Yes, uh, it will look exactly as in PowerPoint. If you click F5 on your keyboard and play it through, it will look exactly the same on the video. Right. And then with CD, um, because I don't actually create CDs very often, would it also then try to burn um, to the CD using if you had a CD burner, or does it just save a uh, ISO file? It creates some auto run files, then you can move to your CD and it will play automatically once you move it to your CD disk. Fantastic. So, uh, and that that sums it up exactly. So, so thank you, Alex. So, in in short, by the way, so just to piggyback to what he was saying, 
when you choose a CD, you can choose, again, some of the ways that it's compressed, uh, looking at making sure the file size is small, but then you may not have to if it's on a CD-ROM. But then what happens is it creates a package that includes a small file that auto runs on your CD so that all you have to do is move everything over to the CD. Once the learner or user puts it into their CD device, it knows to start on whatever the start file is, usually index HTML. So thank you very much for that. All right, thank you very much, guys. And there was also a couple of questions about um, regarding iSpring Cloud. Um, do you have to pay to have access to the iSpring Cloud, or is it part of the license fee? And here I would like to mention that if you purchase the full service for iSpring Suite, you will get an access to iSpring Cloud for one user for 50 files, which can be any size. And um, if you if you would like to get more information about the pricing and options, just please submit your email address and one of our uh, customer care representatives will get back to you. And this is all on my side. And let's get down to our other questions. Okay, so um, question from Al for Alex, I'm sorry, from William. Uh, are there content package file size limits with iSpring Learn LMS? We had this limitation before in version 7, but right now we don't have any limitation and it might be even bigger than 10 gigs. But to tell the truth, I have never made a courses, some, any courses more than 10 gigs. And I hope we never do. <laughs> right. Okay, and the next question, I guess, for Michael from Angela. Is there an FTP upload feature in iSpring? Uh, yes, I believe so. Help me out, Alex. Let's take a look here. So, And again, for those that um, do not know what FTP is or don't use it, it's the way to get your web files up to a web server. Um, is that in the advanced area, Alex? Uh, this option appears when you publish a presentation. Ah. If you click on publish right now, in the preview mode, you will see upload to FTP option. Right, that's right, and I forgot. And there's also the ability to share as well in that, that same area, is that correct? Yes, there are some links to emails, etc. Right, yeah, that's a good point. I, I Thank you for reminding me of that. I forgot about that area. So that's where the FTP is, and so this is where you would specify whatever um, web server, how you log into it, how you get files up to that area. So it may take a moment here on my screen to get to that area, and then when it does, we will show it. Um, Just a few more minutes. We, we may need to move on to the other question as I show this up. Um, sure, uh, and I also wanted to share a comment from um, Christine. I know there are some issues when using very large scoring packages with 1.2 versus 2004 if uploaded into Blackboard. That's good to know, right. And some of those may be handled with the Blackboard administrator as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe like suggesting perhaps the, uh, they can uh, turn that on or off or help you with that. So, But that's good to know on those different versions. Right. And a quick question from um, Javier. Michael, your recommendations, SCORM or XAPI? Um, so that's a personal question. And so uh, <laughs> here, here's, here's a really unfortunately detailed answer. So I would prefer that we move on from SCORM. Uh, and I jokingly say that, you know, sometimes SCORM is only for the people that make the reports. You know, how many people are taking this? What's the efficacy? What's the viability? How long did they spend on each question? Are there any outliers? So that, that suggests that's not important, but that's not true. It's very important. Uh, however, what I'm actually more inclined to, to promote is the learner advocacy, being an advocate for your learner. So normally, in many cases, the learner doesn't care about that side of things. So they do care about maybe celebrating their success of, of whatever learning it is later somewhere else. And that's where the XAPI is very different. Uh, they're, they're very different on how they report things. For instance, one is sort of a, um, you know, so-and-so uh, did this, and here's what they did. It's the action verb standpoint. And so uh, that would be my preference that we really move on to that. But then as many of you know that have done any XAPI work, it's a different creature. Sorry. 
there we go. Sorry, everyone. So um, very quickly before we move on. So this is where we would share upload to FTP and we put our information in. Uh, we could also share the iSpring Cloud again, uh, view in browsers, attach an email to send to someone. So again, sorry, this just got done publishing. I wanted to share that. So moving back back to the XAPI, I would prefer we'd use XAPI. As many of you know, then you have to set up a record store, an LRS. Uh, you have to make sure that you have that communication set up. And then what does the learner do with that information later? There's a lot more to just configure uh, than just that. And as many of you know, sometimes those XAPI experiences can exist inside a SCORM or LMS environment. Um, so getting back to the core of the question, I would prefer we move on as an industry and as, as learning developers and designers over to the XAPI, um, but that's a hard thing to just, you know, across the board make us move to. So, Thank you very much. And let's move on to the next question um, from Marita. And this is the question is for you, Michael. I'd like more information about SCORM. What websites can you suggest? Well, okay, so that's a good question. So well, let's just take a quick look here at the um, browser. So uh, one place, um, and, and it depends. So I know that there are a lot of uh, places to go. So one, you might just Google SCORM Cloud. Uh, and there's a lot of information, not only on the differences between 1.2 and 2004, uh, you can see it's scorm.com here, um, and I'll just click on it, just kind of give you. Now, I'm not necessarily promoting this site. What I'm saying is it's got a lot of good information for knowing what the differences are. So this is a very robust site with a lot of different articles. They, of course, have their own LMSs and own stuff they want you to try. However, this is what normally comes up when you begin uh, looking at, at what is going on for the different SCORM versions for XAPI because they've written so many authoritative articles. Uh, and so that's what I want you to uh, look into is going in for the developers, uh, what the difference is, uh, how to get started. So uh, check this site out first. There's a lot of other good information from industry leaders uh, you may find, but just start with uh, the good old Google um, search and see what happens. But again, that one will pop up first. Uh, I think it's a good place to start. There's a lot of informative articles and even examples. Uh, another place, maybe I can remember, how to, I think it's ADL, maybe I'm not remember, or ADT, I can't remember, uh, the ADL website. Uh, and for those of you that have been doing this for a while, let's see, this is probably ADL SCORM, I think, so. Yeah, SCORM, ADL, not. So this is, uh, it's got a dot .dev. Um, listing and so this is one of the people that first initiated AICC um, content and there's a lot of good resources here and articles the ADL group which is the advanced distributed learning group um, I believe they're the ones that either helped create or created the SCORM versions uh, so take a look here and they also have packages that you can download uh, to begin playing with some of the configuration and again you may not need to do that. Again, if you're using uh, the published settings as we went over, uh, this is something that's done for you, but you can get more information there about the differences and how to do API calls and such with it, so. Awesome, thank you very much, and I hope that answers your question. Um, let's move on to the next one from Teresa. Michael, if I publish to iSpring Cloud, do I then just add a link to the course I would have created in my LMS? Okay, so that's an interesting thought. So um, why I will back up first and, and make sure we're understanding this correctly. So you have content that you've published, you've put it on iSpring Cloud, um, and in that respect, you have a self-contained experience and you may have created a link for that. And you're asking, do you put that link inside the LMS? So part of my hesitation with oh, just I'm going, sorry. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for, um... I didn't read the, the full question. So again, if I publish to iSpring Cloud, do I then just add a link to the course I would have created in my LMS versus uploading a SCORM file? And you, you, for me, you cut out just on the first part of that question. So uh, I, if it's going to live on the LMS, if the content is meant to live on the LMS, you would publish to SCORM and upload to that LMS. If it's something that doesn't live on that, if it's just an, um, remember that you can bring in external information like articles or internet videos inside your content. If it's a, it's a link outside of that, that you still want to present inside your content on the LMS, you could do that as well. 
Thank you very much. And um, the next question is from Michelle. Michael, is it possible with SCORM to determine how long students spend on each question? And if so, how? And maybe Alex can jump in here. Yeah, Alex, jump in. So I think there are ways, but not necessarily. Is that reportable inside the quiz maker here for us? Actually, I missed the first part of your question as I was in the chat. Mm -hmm. I sure, I can, I can repeat it. Um, is it possible with SCORM to determine how long students spend on each question? And if so, how? As far as I know, it's supported in SCORM 2004, and that really depends on the LMS system. If you have this option set up in the LMS, it will track. That's yeah, it. so that's a good, that's a good point. I would double check with whatever LMS system you have, and so the short answer is yes. But then, how you get there, and of course, in this way, we suggested making sure that the LMS has that turned on or off, or it's a setting, and you may need to get with whomever administrates the LMS to find that out. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that is reported in different versions, and again, that's why it was a little funny earlier. And uh, what's the difference between 1.2 and 2004 in two sentences? Well, there's a lot of these tiny differences that are difference in reporting, difference in data collection that are handled simply by the LMS itself and communicated with the SCORM version. So, Right. Thank you very much. And uh, the next question is from Divya. What is the difference between iSpring publish as video option versus PowerPoint publish save as MP4 option? So Alex, I'll let you help out with that. So I, I know that uh, I've done uh, both. I didn't necessarily notice any difference. Was there any difference for you? We should provide a better quality for users, like uh, because we are constantly working on this feature and, and it's still a key feature of, of iSpring Suite. That's why uh, sometimes it happens that our videos a little bit better but in general they look the same. Okay, good. And I'll, I'll add to that, you know, uh, if any of you have done the export on PowerPoint to uh, MP4, you know, there's very little uh, settings as far as how, what the final file size is. But I would encourage you to take a look here at the video publish settings, uh, at the compression, at the size. So there's a lot more to uh, adjust uh, or not adjust or set to higher quality. So that's a good point, Alex, about the difference in quality. But I also would point out here, this, these are a lot of settings you don't get to do necessarily in the MP4 output uh, using PowerPoint. So. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, guys. And um, there's also another question from Divya. What resolutions should a video be published in for it to render well as published output? Uh, and I'll jump in real quickly. So I, I think leaving it at the standard size, but notice in the pull down area, you have presets. Uh, and so depending on these, I would I would double check and make sure that they, they look good. Notice there's even one for portable devices uh, that's a lot smaller configuration. Remember, there's that balance of file size, but in this case, resolution. I would make sure that as you test, and you can do that after publishing, looking at the different either on you know the browser or the device, presets and previews, uh, look at those and make sure they look good. The smaller the, the video in resolution, like dimension-wise, um, it may look a lot different on a tablet or a PC or a, a widescreen uh, computer monitor. So without testing that information, you won't know how it looks. Uh, but again, this is where you would adjust the, the file settings or make a higher quality uh, versus what you need. Um, I, I think there's a 16 by, by 9 aspect ratio, so you can maybe start with the computer and HD devices uh, and go from there and see how it looks on each device. It may be that the content looks great on, on all devices. It may be that you have learners that are not using small form devices like an, uh, you know, a, a mobile handheld device, a phone, a smartphone, uh, and that the larger aspect ratio looks great no matter where because, again, it depends on the learner content and the learners themselves. Thank you very much for your comment, Michael. All right, so another question is from Anne. If I publish a course that includes survey questions to the iSpring Cloud, is there a way to retrieve that survey responses or any other reports? For example, in the same manner as SurveyMonkey able to gather anonymous data, 
Could I email the iSpring Cloud link to specific individuals requesting feedback or use on our intranet? And I think maybe Alex can help out on this one. Once again, I was in a web chat. <laughs> All right, so would you like me to repeat the question? Mm -hmm. All right, you can see, uh, you should be seeing it in the chat. It's from Anne. So she asks, if I publish a course that includes survey questions to the iSpring Cloud, is there a way to retrieve the survey response to any other reports? Um, for example, send a link to specific individuals requesting feedback or use um, on our intranet. Mm -hmm. So when you publish to Lightspin Cloud, you get a short link. And also, Michael is showing you the result hub tab in Lightspin Quiz Maker. And here you can see an option to send quiz results to email. And if you have these options checked, you can always get the results and track what users choose. That's it. Okay. Um, and could you please let us know that? As, okay. And says thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, and a question from Stephanie. Can you publish a course in more than one format? So I will start, and then Alex, I think you can provide more information. So I believe you can. Um, so you could publish for web, you could publish for LMS, for iSpring Learn, for iSpring Cloud, or video. But as we mentioned, with each of these, there's different considerations. Uh, as we mentioned with the video, it's simply the self-contained video of your animations, your transitions. Um, if you expected the learners to click on something, it may not do it. Um, so. The same thing, if you expected to uh, understand how long learners were taking on quiz results or you needed those, maybe the web isn't uh, the viable option for you. So I, I think you can always publish these as each separately uh, and you save them or publish them wherever, uh, but it, it depends on what the content is and, and what's required at that point, whether or not it's going to be the most workable, the most usable on whatever that environment is. Is that sort of what you're tracking as well, Alex? It's true. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Um, question from Michelle to Alex: How can we determine if if it has been zipped twice? And I guess this is referring to the previous question. Yes, we have a discussion with Michelle through. Uh, <laughs> So it happens that in some MS systems, you can upload a zip package that was wrapped wrongly. And this way, you will get not a course, but a zip package. And this can happen when you publish it twice or when the manifest.xml file is not in the folder, in the main folder. And that's why users get a zip package instead of course. And that, that really depends on the LMS system, how it unwraps this information, uh, this information, this package. But the general tip is to check whether you move a zip file with manifest.xml in, in the general folder, in the general path. It should be exactly in the first uh, folder. When you open your zip package, it should be there. Otherwise, you can get a zip package as your users do. That's okay, it. yeah, thank you very much for that explanation. And um, the last question that uh, I hope you guys can cover for us today is from Tony. Are there any reliable iPad emulators for Windows 10? Oh, um, there are several websites uh, that I have used. So let, let's go back. And so, um, you know, Alex, if you'd like to jump in. so. Here's one thing. So during testing, there's a lot of different ways. You'll notice that I have Chrome open here, and, and the same goes for Firefox. Um, and again, this would be independent of, of Windows or whatever. Uh, but hitting F12 and going in my developer tools, um, I have a new uh, you know configuration comes up on the on the right. I can see the code. I can see what's going on. The elements on that page. I can identify what CSS is going. But but here we can also do some emulation. Now, this isn't the end-all, be-all, um, but clicking here on the device toolbar, 
uh, we have several presets. And so you notice that uh, the look and feel of this page has changed. Uh, I get a little round dot that suggests where my finger would be. I'm using my mouse at this point, but it itself emulates um, the experience of an iPad. We'll go up to a, just to preview it. And so uh, we can also do iPad Pro. Now this comes configured within Chrome. Uh, and you'll find a similar one in Firefox. But um, there are other websites that provide the same emulation, uh, and I don't use a lot of them, to be quite honest with you, and they've changed over the years. Uh, some are better, some are worse. Alex, do you have any additional suggestions besides this? We usually do testing the way you showed, uh, and also the best way to tell the truth is to open your iPad and do everything there as even when you open everything in simulation on your desktop it can look different on real ipad yeah i completely agree so that's a great point so always as we continue to talk about this stuff test test again and then test again so and and again this isn't the only way of course you could uh, i believe use the uh, publish settings and preview via tablet and that but that that's at least one way to get you started uh, i would to suggest Googling some other ways, but again, as Alex mentioned, getting the content on the iPad and viewing it. And I'll add to that, knowing that some of you may be using an LMS system, preview it, not only the content just by itself, but package it in SCORM, upload it to the LMS and view that on your iPad, because even some of the ways that LMS has provide that information out, um, because some of them wrap it in a SCORM wrapper, for lack of a better term, uh, provide it in a pop-up or a different window or in a frame set, Make sure that runs well for your iPad users or other mobile users or any user. So that's a good point, Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And Michelle asks, um, going back to her previous question, thank you, Alex. That was helpful. The sound cut out a little bit, so I just wanted to clarify. Did you say the manifest.xml is in the very first folder? What about index.html? Is that important to you? Alex? Usually, usually you should see index HTML in data or res. That depends on the SCORM standard you choose, but uh, you shouldn't see this in the main folder. The file that you need to see there is ismanifest.xml. And also, Michelle, I'm sharing a, a screenshot of how it should look like in WebChat right now. Okay, thank you very much. And um, okay, I think at this point we have covered all the questions and we are um, just on time. We have to wrap up. <laughs> so I would like to thank all of you guys for coming today to our uh, webinar. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you very much, Michael, for covering this topic for us. People say that they enjoyed and it was a brilliant presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Polina. So join us next week. We'll be looking at a lot of ways and a lot of good content out there and showcasing and, and celebrating those items as well. So thanks, everyone, for coming again. Right, and thank you very much, Alex, for covering the questions during our webinar in the chat. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for your invitation. <laughs> Always welcome. All right, so I hope all of you guys have a wonderful day today, and we'll see you next week on Wednesday. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.